Well, good evening. Welcome to uh, the services of Victory Baptist Temple. We're delighted that you're with us on this Wednesday night. You've taken time to tune in. We had a great service on Sunday morning. The Lord held off the rain and uh, it was just a good message that Brother Jeff brought. Also, uh, Miss Esther, her song that she sang, and it was just a wonderful time. I'm thankful for the resurrection. Tonight, we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So if you get your Bible ready, we'll, uh, we'll look at the scriptures there. I'm going to bring a message this evening entitled, The Believer's Blessed Hope. The Believer's Blessed Hope. I'm glad I have a hope. And Paul is going to deal with that in a, in a real uh, good detail. And we're going to look at that tonight. Before we do that, we're going to have some singing. And Andrew's going to lead us in a song, What a Day That Will Be, When My Jesus I Shall See. I love that song. It's real special to me, and I hope it's special to you. We're going to sing both verses, so you sing along right there. And then after that, Sarah and her family is going to sing a song for us before I bring tonight's message. There is coming a day no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye, all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be.
Well, I appreciate that music by the Edgies. Appreciate all our church family and all of you that sing. And I look forward to being back together. I'll tell you, I was thinking today about the choir and our last choir practice, how well that went. And we we're singing some new songs and then we just separated. But we're looking forward to being back together when we can sing together, when we can listen to God's word together and we can just fellowship together. You have your Bible open there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tonight. I want to begin reading in verse number 13. Paul says here under inspiration, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, Paul says, comfort one another with these words. You know, one of the great expectations of the church is that of the blessed hope. Titus talks about that in Titus chapter 2 in verse 13. The Bible says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I, um, I, I look forward to his return and I hope you are looking forward to his, his return. One of the things that Paul and one of the reasons why Paul wrote this epistle to the Thessalonians is because that he only he was only able to be with them for a short time. The Bible says he was only there three Sabbath days and then he was kicked out of town for sharing the gospel and he could not go back there. Um, but he could still write letters. And these folks um, that Paul was with, he only had a short time to train them and to teach them. And he had spoken to them about the Lord's return but he really didn't give them a lot of details. And so that's why he was able to write this. You know, Paul then had Timothy take this letter back to the Thessalonians and share that with them. Now, before Paul goes into details about the blessed hope, or he goes into this catching away, the catching away of believers to be with Christ, and he assures the Thessalonians about this hope that they will see their loved ones again. You know, this afternoon, as I was thinking about this message, I, I thought about those who have gone on before us. I thought about people here in our church who uh, knew Christ as their Savior, and they're no longer here. You know, we miss them greatly, don't we? We miss Miss Parker sitting over here and clapping her hands and praising God. But, you know, can I tell you on the authority of the Word of God, we have a hope that we'll see her again. And I hope tonight that you have that hope of eternal life. In Paul's day, the pagan world had no hope. Um, there, this is a typical inscription on a grave that demonstrated that lack of hope. It went like this. I was not. I became. I am not. I care not. You know, <laughs> believers <clears throat> in Thessalonica were concerned about their loved ones. They were concerned about whether they would see them again and what would happen when the Lord returned. Would uh, their handicapped believers still be that way? Would they go up before the believers went up, before the, those that were dead in Christ go up? And they were concerned about those type of things. And Paul's encouragement to them was a great comfort to them. And it should be for you and me tonight as well. So I want us to look at uh, about four fundamental facts about the resurrection or about our blessed hope. The first thing I want you to see tonight is a revelation hope. A revelation hope. You know, Paul gives two significant reasons for informing the brethren about these questions about eschatology. Now, I know that's a big, long word, eschatology, but it's really talking about end time events or last events. And we as believers are looking forward to this time. <clears throat> and this will be the thing that kicks off the final seven years. But the first thing Paul gives them is reassurance about revelation. He didn't want them the Bible says here, he did not want them to sorrow or to be ignorant. He didn't want them to be unhappy. Didn't want them to be ignorant about some these things about Christ's return. 
He also didn't want them to be unhappy. He didn't want them to sorrow. And I'm sure, you know, people had sorrow in those days, but as believers, they didn't have to have any sorrow. And the basis for Paul's teaching here is found in verse 15. He says here, I say this, un we say this unto you by the word of the Lord. By the word of the Lord. This was not Paul's opinion. This is not something he made up. He, said, he didn't say, well, I think this or I believe this. But he said, I'm telling you this by revelation from God himself. It's the revelation of the Lord, the word of God. And you know what? His revelation on future events that God gives to us, we don't have to wonder. We don't have to say, I wonder what's going to happen. On the basis of the word of God, we know what is going to happen. We understand future events. Now, we don't understand how it's all going to unfold or how it's all going to happen, but we do know some certain things that God has given us about that. And so God gives Paul a special revelation about <clears throat> the resurrection of saints and the reappearing of Jesus Christ. Now, I say reappearing because Jesus came the first time. That was called the incarnation when he took on flesh and he dwelt among us, like John says. But he's going to come back again, and that's called the second advent. He's not going to come back as a weak and lowly Jesus, but he's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's an exciting time. That's something we have to look forward to. So what Paul taught them here about, you know, the resurrection, Jesus taught them about. In, back in John chapter number five, I'm going to turn back there to my Bible. You may want to yourself. But in John chapter five, in verse 25, Jesus said this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. So here Jesus is saying, you're going to hear my voice and those that hear my voice will live, will live again. And then, of course, Jesus spoke about he, him, himself being the resurrection and the life. In John chapter 11, you'll remember with me there about Lazarus. And Lazarus had died, but Jesus didn't say he died. He told the disciples, he is asleep. And the disciples said, well, master, if he sleeps, he does well. Of course, that wasn't what Jesus was talking about. He, he finally comes and tells them he is dead. Oh, oh, he's dead. You know, any believer that trusts in Jesus Christ as a personal savior is not dead. The Bible says they're asleep. They're asleep in Christ. <clears throat> and so since Christ conquered death, we do not have to fear death. We do not have to fear the grave. We, we, sure, we don't, we don't look forward to dying, but we don't have to fear it. It's no longer our enemy because of what Jesus has done. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is what Jesus says there in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 12. The Bible says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. You see, there, uh, Paul says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we have a vain hope. Our preaching, what I'm preaching tonight is just a vain, empty thing. But thank the Lord. We have the authority of the word of God that says there is a resurrection, that we are going to rise from the dead. By the authority that God gives us in the word of God, we have that assurance. And I'm glad tonight that I have that assurance and the comfort that I need. But the second thing is there's a reassurance about resurrection, a reassurance about resurrection. The main concern of the folks at Thessalonica was about the believers who had already died. And Paul says here, them which are asleep. Now, Paul used and applied this word asleep to those believers who had died. And I've already mentioned that. And Jesus applied that same word to Lazarus. He is asleep. But can I say to you tonight that, that Jesus or Paul does not use that word for Jesus? The Bible says here in, in verse number 14, for if we believe that Jesus died. It does not say that Jesus 
went to sleep. It says that Jesus died. He died. Now, that word sleep is never applied to the Lord Jesus and his experience. Why, you say? Why isn't it applied to Jesus? Because he died that we not need fear death. We don't have to fear death because he died. In Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 14, this is what the Bible says. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, the Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, so he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus died, so I don't have to fear death. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. He conquered the devil so that I don't have to die if I know Christ is my Savior. You don't have to die. You can just go to sleep. You can go to sleep. And so Paul makes it clear here that the first prerequisite for resurrection of ourselves is faith in Jesus Christ. He said we must believe that he died and that he rose again. Are, do you know that? Are you assured? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he rose the third day according to the scriptures? That's what Easter is all about. That's what we just celebrated. And it's a great victorious day when he rose from the dead. So Paul makes it clear that our loved ones who die in Christ will return with Christ in a new body. And let me say here that, that this, this body, it's the body that sleeps. It's not the soul that sleeps. It's not the spirit that sleeps. It's the body that sleeps. We don't believe in soul sleep. We don't believe in spirit sleep. You see, um, here's God's definition of death. In James chapter 2, verse 26, it says, For as the body without the spirit is dead. You see, that's it. So at death, the spirit and the soul, they leave the body and the body goes to sleep. It goes to sleep. It doesn't function anymore. But the spirit and the soul go to be with the Lord. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8 say, say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So while somebody leaves their body, it falls asleep. They don't go to sleep. They're wide awake. They are wide awake. And the soul is very conscious after death. And if you want to look at that in the, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, it talks about the, the rich man of Lazarus. The rich man, he died and he lifted up his eyes, being in hell, being in torments. And Lazarus was comforted. They were very much cognizant of what was going on, even though their body was still here on earth. You know, I read of a preacher who was trying to console a friend in the loss of his wife. And the preacher said, I hear that you lost your wife. He said, I, I'm very sorry about that. And the man replied, no, 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 no. I didn't lose her. You can't lose something when you know where it is. And he said, and I know where she is. And so on the authority of the word of God tonight, we know what will happen when Christ returns. He will come and he will bring back his loved ones with him, his people. Now you say to me tonight, well, when's that going to happen? When is that going to occur? Well, the fact of the matter is we just don't know. Now, Jesus for a while didn't know, but I know he knows now. When he was on earth, he didn't know that. Only the Father knew it. But he knows now when that time is going to come, when he'll return. But the fact of the matter is, well, we don't know, we're to be ready. We're to be ready as we wait for the Lord to bring back our loved ones with him and for us to meet them in the air. We're to be ready. And Paul, the fact that Paul uses the pronoun we in verse 15, he says, for this we, and in verse 17, he uses the word we, then we which are alive and remain. Paul thought that Jesus was going to return during his lifetime. And every generation since Christ went to, went to heaven has, has had that hope that this generation may be the generation 
with, that will see Jesus Christ come. Can I say, if you are still alive and remain, you'll be caught up, you'll be changed and caught up together with them, the, the folks that have gone before us, to meet the Lord in the air. That's our expectation. That's our hope, you know. I hope, my hope's not in the undertaker tonight. My hope is in the upper taker, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that I know Him as my personal Savior. So, you see, we don't know when that's going to be, and we're not told to look for signs. You know, sometimes people say, well, th that looks like a sign of Jesus coming. Can I say there's no signs for the rapture, but there are signs for the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture is like the pre-beginning of the, 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 the time when Jesus is going to come literally to this earth. You know, um, if I can illustrate it this way, during uh, Christmas holidays, coming up to that, you begin to see signs of Christmas in the store. There's Christmas things that are out. But one of the things that gets overlooked is Thanksgiving. There's not very many signs for Thanksgiving. But when you start seeing Christmas things out, you, you begin to think, oh, Thanksgiving must be coming. Now, while we can see some things that may look like the second advent is going to come, we know as Christians that there are no signs. We as believers are to be watching, first of all, and we're to be warring. We're to watch, be looking for the blessed hope, and we're to be at war. And uh, because we're warriors and we're soldiers of Jesus Christ, we war against the world, we war against our own flesh, and we war against the devil. And that's what we're doing while we're waiting for this, looking for our Savior. So we don't look for signs, but we look for the Savior, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, we have to have this sense of eminence for the return of Christ and that sense that He's coming causes us and should cause us to live a sanctified life, to live a holy life. Because we don't know when He's coming, we're to be always ready for His return. But the second thing I want you to see tonight is the resurrection hope. The resurrection hope. You know, when Paul preached the doctrine of the resurrection to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, they mocked him. When they, he talked about, you know, the, there's going to be a resurrection, they mocked him. They said, why would you, somebody want to come back. Now in their carnal minds, they're thinking, why would I want to come back in this body? And how in the world, you know, after I've decayed and all my, my body has gone back to the elements, why would I want to gather that all up and everything? And Paul, Paul was preaching the truth, but that wasn't what he was preaching. He wasn't preaching a, a reconstruction of this body. That was not what he was saying. And that's why the Athenians said, oh, you're crazy. This is a new thing. We, 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 we don't understand it, but, but uh, it's, it's, it's illogical, it's foolish, and it's impossible, is what the Athenians thought. But the fact of the matter is that Christ is the main attraction of the resurrection. He's it, you see. Too many people get excited about the particulars of eschatology instead of the person of eschatology. Paul emphasizes in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, that says that Christ is the main attraction because He will give a crown of righteousness to those who love His appearing. Now, the Bible says that when Christ shall appear, there's going to be, first of all, um, there'll be a shout. Now, verse number 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I don't know what that shout's going to be, but it may be, Hey, it's time! Here I am, <laughs> but there's a shout. I think Jesus is excited about us being with him. I mean, he's looked forward to it for a long time. And to Christ, it's already done. It's already happened because he inhabits eternity. But for you and me, we look forward to that shout. Maybe it's like when, when Jesus was outside Lazarus' tomb. You know, he shouted Lazarus' name. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus did come forth. And maybe each one of us in the grave will hear our name. You say, that's impossible. I don't think so. Not with God. All things are possible with the Lord. Maybe he'll call our names all at once. But there's a shout. 
And then the Bible says it's like a military command. It's a shout of authority. And all saints will respond immediately. Boom. And then the Bible says there's the voice of the archangel. Now, there's only one archangel named in the Bible. His name is Michael. His name is Michael, and that's in Daniel chapter 10 and verse uh, 13. It also seems to indicate there that there's more than one archangel. We can't be sure that it's Michael, but Jude 1.9 talks about Michael. It has his name there too. So we can't be sure that it's Michael. There may be other archangels, but we know it is an archangel who will uh, give his voice. Then the Bible says there'll be a signal. And that signal is the sound of a trumpet. Doo, 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 doo. Trumpet, the sound of a trumpet. You know, I used to play the trumpet. I don't anymore. My lip is just gone. But Brother Parker used to have me go back in the baptistry back there, and he'd have me play the trumpet when he's preaching on the Lord's return to try to scare people, maybe. They're like, oh, oh, it's happening. Well, I didn't sound like that trump that you and I will hear. But it is a sound of a trumpet. In, in the Bible, the, the trumpets were used to get people together, to cause them to come together. And so God is going to sound a trumpet. And the fact of the matter is that our catching away to be with Christ will be a quick and with an audible sound. We'll hear it. We will hear it. Now, the first thing that will happen is our great hope, especially that we've had for those who have died in Christ. There will be a resurrection. The Bible says when that happens, then the dead, in verse 16, the last part of that verse, the dead in Christ shall rise first. They're going to go up first. And then, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And how quickly will that be? Well, I don't even think there'll be a separation of time. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, it says it will be in the twinkling of an eye. Some people say it's that little twinkle you see in your eye. I don't know, but it's very quick. It's a very quick rapture. And we will be changed from mortal to immortal, to immortality. And this doctrine of the resurrection assures us that, that, that the grave is not the end. That death is not the end for you or me. You see, the body goes to sleep, but the soul and the spirit goes to be with the Lord. And when Christ returns in the air, he will bring those souls that have already gone before us, that are asleep right now, their souls, he's going to bring them back with him. He'll bring them back with him and he will, he will reunite the soul with the body and it'll be a brand new body. It won't be this body. It won't be reconstituted. It will be a new body that God has prepared for us. And so um, this is something that we'll share forever. And that leads me to the third point tonight that gives us comfort and assurance. And that is our removing hope. Our removing hope. I mentioned it several times here, but I want to say it again. The Bible says that we'll be caught up in verse 17. We'll be caught up together with them. The word caught up uh, is, is um, an encouragement for those people that were sour, souring. They were souring, they were sorrowful about the fact that their loved ones were gone. And so he gives them this hope. And the word caught up means it's a word uh, in the Latin raptu from which we get our word rapture. It means to seize or to carry off. And uh, Paul says not only those who are alive will be caught up, but those We'll be caught up together with those. And so we'll be caught up together, the Bible says, in clouds. Literally, that word the is not there. In clouds. Now, John Butler says, you know, we're thinking about clouds as far as puffy clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But, but he, he seems to think that will be clouds of people. There'll be clouds of people who know the Lord as their personal Savior. So we'll be together this mass of called the church of believers who know Christ as their Savior. There will be clouds of believers, perhaps, and will meet the Lord in the air. And the word meet is one of pleasantness. It's one of encouragement. You know, in, in this life, we have sorrow. When a brother or sister in Christ dies, we sorrow. But like Paul says, we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. We have a hope because we're going to meet 
them again. We'll meet them in the air. And that's, an, that's a great thing. This word meet was used to denote the reception of a newly arrived person or magistrate. And that reception was one of welcome. My goodness, I can just imagine in my mind meeting my mom and dad again, meeting Mrs. Parker again, meeting those people from Victory Baptist that I've known for years that are, are not here, but they're with the Lord. What a meeting that will be. Somebody wrote a song that meeting in the air. I'm excited about it. I hope you are tonight to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll meet with them and it's forever forever. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? I mean, think about this life. Everything in this life has an end. And we're talking about death tonight. Death is an end. You know, something finishes. But, but when we're with the Lord, it's forever. It will never end. Those people that we know who've gone on before us, our, our reunion, our meeting in the air will never end. My, that's a great hope. That's encouraging. It's something like that's hard to imagine. It just kind of blows your mind. But the fact is, God's word is true. And we are going to meet people in the air. We'll meet our beloved ones. In John 14, 3, Jesus said, I will come again. He told his disciples to encourage their hearts. If I go away, I will come again. And and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And, and the great goal of the redemption is not simply escape from wrath, but also an eternal resort with the Lord, to be with him. And of course then, what will follow is the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be judged, and that's a whole nother message. Not going to preach on that tonight, but we are talking about our resurrection. Now, the last thing I want you to see tonight before we go is our resting hope. Our resting hope. Paul here in verse 18 says, Wherefore, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Revelation brings responsibility when I know something, I have to do something with what I know. The fact is, if I know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, if I know that He is the only way to heaven, my responsibility then is to tell somebody about that. When I know the revelation, I am responsible to follow through and do something with what I know. And here, when God gives us a revelation regarding the future, he does so with an application to the now, to the present. And that is here, he says, we are to comfort one another with these words. What words, you say? Well, the words of God. You know, there's a lot of words in the world. A lot of people use a lot of words, but the only words that bring comfort, the only words that really give somebody comfort in their heart is the word of God. Because it is true, it is living, it is alive, and it's powerful. And so this word comfort means to aid, to help, to encourage. So the knowledge of our catching away to be with Christ will be of no comfort to unbelievers, but it is comforting to believers, to those who know Christ as their Savior. And notice that Paul says we are to comfort one another with these words. With these words, God's words are the only words that are able to give comfort. And, and, and Paul says in verse 15, he says, I, I'm telling you this by the word of the Lord. On the authority of the word of God, there is a resurrection. You're going to see your loved ones who are in Christ again. So tonight, you know, death is a fact of life. The soul that sinneth, it will die. We all are going to die. And the only way we can escape its clutches, the only way we'll not experience the second death is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Death is not an accident. It is an appointment. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the Bible says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. 
So if you were to die today, if you were to die tonight, do you know that you are on your way to heaven? You say to me, no, Brother Miller, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. How can I know? Well, the Bible says it right here. If we believe that G Jesus died and rose again. You see, the fact of the matter is tonight, we're all sinners. The Bible says for all is sin and come short of the glory of God. And as sinners, we deserve death. We deserve punishment. Death in the Bible is not just being buried, but it means separation from God forever in a place called hell. But you know what? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, I'm glad the Bible says whosoever. I'm glad the Bible doesn't just have a certain name there, but whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Should not perish. That means lose your life, go to hell, but have everlasting life. You can have a lever, everlasting life in this life. You say, how can I have that? You know, the world wants to live forever. There are, I've watched science, science uh, documentaries where people are trying to figure out how we can make ourselves live longer or live forever. But you know what? You know what tonight? It's not a scientific thing that we have to go through. It's by trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And when that happens, He gives you eternal life. It is a miracle. A miracle. Do you know Christ is your Savior? Have you been born again? Without being born again, you have no hope of a resurrection. Oh, you'll have a resurrection, but not this one we're talking about here tonight. The blessed hope. It's a horrible hope. You'll be resurrected again, but not, not like the saints will be. Not like we will be. We won't be, uh, you'll, you'll be resurrected in this, this kind of flesh, this old flesh. And then to be, uh, to face the great white throne judgment and then to be hurled out into the lake of fire. Oh, my friend, that's horrible. And that's true. It's in this Bible right here. But you know what? That doesn't have to happen to you. You can be saved. You can be born again. An epitaph on a British gravestone not far from Windsor Castle reads this way. Pause, my friend, as you walk by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so will you be. Prepare, my friend, to follow me. But then somebody else later, later added these lines to that. They said, to follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. Did you go to heaven? Did you go to hell? You know, we believers have the wonderful assurance of the resurrection. Because Jesus rose again, we will rise again. And all those people that we know who've gone before us, who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, oh, we'll see them again. We'll see them again. And it will never end. We'll be forever with the Lord. And God promised us that He'll... As he will change them, he will change us. You see, what you see now is not what you're going to see. This is just a seed that God's going to use to make me glorious. There will be a glory for the children of God. And that glorious change comes when he changes this vile body to be like unto his glorious body. You say, well, you know me? Well, you might look like you, but you're a whole lot better than you are now. And I'm glad I am born again. Tonight, do you have that hope? I hope so. I trust so. If you don't, my, uh, you can contact us here at Victory Baptist Temple. And uh, you can find our phone number. Give us a call. And we can take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. And then if you're saved, it's good news. You remember, uh, uh, Revelation brings responsibility. And our responsibility, my friend, is to tell somebody about Jesus. Well, God bless you. Let's pray tonight. And then uh, we'll see you Sunday at 1030 for our drive-in service. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God, that's you, and our Savior, that's you, Jesus Christ. I thank you that we can be assured of that because your word is true. And if we follow your way, we put our faith and trust in you as our Savior, then you will, you will give us eternal life. Pray for our folks, Lord, in a special way. Be with them, continue to give us, and help us to be uh, witnesses for you of these good things, these glad tidings that you have for us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.